expecting from you. Um, so every time I say he is risen today, I hope at home you are saying he is risen indeed. And maybe if you don't say it, maybe your dog will bark, your cat will meow, or whatever will take place, who's ever there worshiping with you. God loves you today. Uh, God is so glad that you're here. And we are so glad that you've chosen to join with us as well. Uh, God has been blessing me this week, especially with some good weather around here. And so we just praise him. And of course, really we're praising him today because today is the day we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what an awesome God we serve and how awesome it is to know that he is living, that he lives within us, and that the day will come when we'll be with him for all eternity. Let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our risen Savior. We thank you for his death on the cross that paid the price for our sins when we believe in you, that redeemed us, that reconciled us, and brings us close to you. We thank you for the resurrection that brings us eternal life as he overcame death and we will with him. Father, thank you for all that this day means. Father, as we gather together online in our living rooms or here at church, Father, we just pray your rich blessing would fall upon us. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would enrich us, that you, O oh Lord, would draw us closer together. And even though we mourn today the loss of family time, of fellowship with one another, of Easter egg hunts and parties that we may not get to partake of, Father, we are grateful for the opportunity we have to spend time with you. So right now, would you just allow us to calm our hearts, to lay at your feet those things that might hinder our worship of you, would you speak to us and be free to examine our hearts today and open us up and show us, Lord, how we're doing. Father, thank you for all that you're about to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to share a few announcements with you today for our church, uh, for our church family, and for all who are watching. Uh, first of all, uh, we do a thing each year in our church called District Assembly. Our churches meet together uh, in April, and we have delegates to go, and all those things have been canceled for this year, just so you know. Um, instead, uh, District Assembly will do an online worship service on Sunday night at 6 p.m. Uh, it's next Sunday on the 19th. On Monday morning from 9 to, uh, to noon, they are also going to do kind of an inspiration and encouragement service for those who want to watch. And it's open to all people, so if you simply go to our district website at uh, wapacnest.org, I believe it is, um, you can get on there and see what's going on with our district assembly. Uh, the business side of it has been taken to our what's called our district advisory board, and they'll take care of the business side of it. You know, with all this going on, we want to encourage you to stay connected, to call one another, to lift each other up in prayer over the phone, to use Facebook, whatever social media you have at your disposal, and just to reach out. Uh, we may not get together in our services, but we can get together uh, by talking and simply by, by loving each other. Uh, we got some cards this week. Uh, the kids got a couple cards. For Easter and what a touchy thing it is when we receive even mail anymore. Things of, so it seem to be able to pass. But so reach out to one another, love one another, pray for one another uh, as best we can over the phone as we wait for the day to open up that we can get back together at church. Speaking of church, we do have uh, uh, an updated website. We're working on things and it's slowly coming together, but make sure you check us out at everettfirstnaz.org uh, and see what information we have available there as well. Uh, I am if you haven't found out, started a daily word of encouragement, and typically you can find those through the church website or going to my YouTube channel. Also wanted to thank you this morning for those of you who pay your tithes and offerings here, who this is your home church. Uh, we appreciate your faithfulness in these difficult times. Uh, God will bless you for it. Uh, if you're watching this today and you have a home church, maybe we just encourage you to continue to support them as best you can. Uh, lots of churches are hurting right now financially, and of course we, we trust God to provide. Uh, but God calls us as his people to provide as he provides to us. And so be encouraged to give and, and trust that God will provide for you uh, wherever your home church is. And that being said, I think that's all the announcements I need to share here today. If you ever have any questions, you're always welcome to call me or text me on my cell phone um, or here at the church. I'd love to talk to you or to pray with you or to answer whatever questions we have. So I think that's all the announcements today. Uh, we want to move forward by singing a song with you. Uh, we've got this song off of YouTube, but, but wanted to share it. It's called Up From The Grave, He Arose. Let's sing it together.
This morning I want to share with you from the Gospel of Matthew, starting at chapter 28. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. I'll give you just a second to get there. Uh, you know, I watched a couple of services already this week, uh, this weekend, uh, one this morning, one yesterday, and one of our brothers shared the idea that most of us have heard this story time and time again. As pastors, we really can't add to it, uh, and I would certainly agree with that. Uh, and part of his message he shared out of the book of John, but he shared several chapters. Uh, and I want to encourage you today. Uh, you might take time to read with your family the account of what took place, maybe from the time Jesus was arrested up until the time he was resurrected. So, um, you know, oftentimes during Christmas, we want to gather with our families and read the Christmas story. Let's make sure today that we read the Easter story, if at all possible, with our families. So again, this morning, I want to read for you from chapter Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, where they will see me. Father God, as we break this bread of life and you share the call in my heart this morning, speak to us anew and afresh about what it means to believe in Jesus and his death and his resurrection. Father, thank you for all that you're about to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you hopefully have heard, we are going to partake of communion after the service today as, as part of our honoring him. Uh, typically, we would always do that within the church, and yet today we find ourselves separate from the church uh, in our own homes. So if you have not yet, sometime over the next few minutes or, or after the sermon while we sing our song before communion, I would invite you to gather some juice and some crackers or something uh, that's of a drink and, and something that we can use as symbols uh, for our partaking of communion together to celebrate the death of Jesus on the cross. Um, the, the sermon I use for a title, the title I use for my sermon today is, Does Your Heart Believe It? You know, you've probably heard, if you live in Everett, but here in Everett, our Angel of the Winds Arena, where our beloved sewer tips play, has been turned into a temporary COVID-19 quarantine uh, location so, an isolation site for Snohomish County. I also noticed the other day that the south parking lot of Everett's Memorial Stadium seems to have been turned into a major testing site. The good news, bad news, if you will, is that in my travels by these two places, I haven't seen much activity that supports their need. Either way, they're there because those in positions of, of data and support believe they could be a, <coughs> excuse me, that there could be a need for them, so they prepare them as quickly as possible. You know, our current reality is that everywhere we go, we believe we can be subject to the spreading of the COVID-19 virus. I stopped by Safeway the other day to pick up some essentials, and the store was fairly full, or at least seen that way as most people try their best to keep up with social distancing practices. The ironic piece for me is that everybody is treating it a little bit differently. There are those that have masks and gloves on because they're sick and believe it's the best way to keep from spreading whatever it is they have. There are those who have masks and gloves on even though they're not sick because they believe it will protect them from somebody else who does have it. There are those that only have masks and there are those that only seem to have gloves. So maybe they couldn't find both or couldn't afford both or maybe they don't believe both are necessary. There are those who wear nothing extra. They look like typical shoppers from three or four months ago. They believe they're safe shopping just the way they are. And there are those who wear nothing extra, but they seem like they could be sick. They must believe that they won't spread whatever it is they do have. So basically, we could say that most, if not all, the people at Safeway that they were responding by what they believed about the COVID-19 virus. You know, our beliefs are a funny thing. According to a Google Dictionary website,
website. A belief is an acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists. But the definition doesn't tell us about beliefs is that they are subject to a wide spectrum of how much we believe in. Meaning that there's a spectrum for the COVID-19 virus where at one end, people believe that it's most likely fatal for all, except for those who try every measure to protect themselves and then get lucky on top of that. And then you have the other end of people who believe the media is all hype and that they have nothing to worry about. Most of us fall somewhere in between. Personally, I find myself somewhere in the middle where I want to follow recommended precautions because I love people and want to prepare and take care of people. At the same time, I believe that God is in control. I want to be available to serve Him as He directs and to serve His people. Having said all that, what if I suggested to you that your belief in the death of Jesus on the cross, as well as your belief in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, fall on their own spectrums as well? And where you're at on those spectrums makes all the difference in this life and in eternity. So today, as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday, I want to ask I want to ask two questions. The first is, what do you believe about the death of Jesus on the cross? Now, for the sake of this message, we're going to start with the premise that Jesus was a real person who was crucified on a cross. The reason we start with this premise is because there are multiple ancient resources, both Christian and non-Christian, that speak to this premise. Richard Bauckham, a leading scholar in this area, concludes that the Gospels embody the testimony of the eyewitnesses not, of course, without editing and interpretation, but in a way that is substantially faithful to how the eyewitnesses themselves told it. He shows that the gospel writers were in more or less direct contact with eyewitnesses. And the Greek writer Lucian writes, The Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. He adds that Jesus was crucified in Palestine, a further corroboration of the gospels. So once we accept that Jesus was a real person who was crucified on the cross, we need to ask the question, does his death mean anything to us? Does it have value for us? Well, let's go back to the basics for a moment. The Bible tells us in the beginning that God created all things, including mankind. The first man, Adam, sinned, and because God is holy, it causes separation between God and mankind. In the Old Testament, God instituted a, a sacrificial system where the priest would make a sacrifice as an atonement for sin. And the prophets testified to a coming Messiah who would take on the sins of the world. In fact, if we read from Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, we read, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul reiterates the message of the prophets when he tells us in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, we read, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And of course, most of, of, course, most of us know the passage from John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And of course, Jesus himself was quoted in John 14, 6 as saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So again, we ask the question, what do you believe about the death of Jesus on the cross? Was it the death of an ordinary man? Or was it the death of a blasphemous man as the chief priests and elders proclaimed? Or was it the death of a great teacher in the Jewish faith? Or was it the death of the Messiah, the Son of God? You see, based on what you believe, we have to ask the question, what does this death mean for you? You see, if Jesus is anything other than the Messiah, anything other than the Savior of the world or the Lamb of God, then his death really has no meaning for you. In fact, we would say even his teaching at this point has no meaning for you because in his own words, at least in part, that he proclaimed, it was a lie. Therefore, we would still be subject to the penalty or consequences of our sin. On the other hand, if we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, then his death means that the penalty of sin has been paid for those who choose him. That we have been made right or justified with God and have been reconciled to him. The glory of God. Amen? We 
have the opportunity to choose him, to believe in his death on the cross as his penalty, as a sacrificial lamb of God, as the one who had no sin and became the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Praise God. Well, that leads us to the second question on this Resurrection Sunday. What do you believe about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? We turn over to our text this morning in Matthew 28, but you could also find it. It's recorded in Mark 16 and in Luke 24 and, of course, John 20. And while most of us would agree that Jesus was crucified and find himself somewhere on the spectrum of what his death means for people, there are fewer people who believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Instead, they say things like the body of Jesus was either stolen from the tomb or never really placed there to begin with. There are those out there who believe that the resurrection stories are simply lies fabricated by early Christian writers. And again, the truth is what you believe about the resurrection makes an eternal difference. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 and 19, Paul basically says that if Christ did not rise from the dead, then Christianity as a whole is false. Therefore, we are still in our sins, and there is no hope beyond the grave. Folks, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty depressing. So let's ask the question, what evidence is there for the physical resurrection of Christ? Well, if we start or look at verse 9 of our text, we read, Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They, the girls, came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. The fact that they were able to grab onto his feet tells us that it was a physical body of Jesus with them. It wasn't just a spirit or a voice or, or something they felt. The physical body of Jesus stood with them. Second, according to the scripture, that same physical body of Jesus appeared over the next 40 days to more than a few hundred people on multiple occasions. And it bore the scars and even the nail holes that he had endured. Third, we have the continued lives of the disciples and Christ's followers as evidence of his redemption. Think about it. After Jesus was arrested, the disciples deserted him. In fact, scripture tells us that Peter goes on to deny him three times. And yet after Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples came back together to proclaim his re resurrection in the very city in which he was crucified, knowing this could mean their own suffering as possible death. Think about that. Peter would go on to declare in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John adds in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. And of course, we know that many of the disciples would end up dying for their faith. And it didn't end with the disciples. People have been dying for their faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ ever since. Now, if you think about modern-day cult leaders, maybe Jim Jones or David Koresh, both claim to be messiahs of their faith. Yet what happened when they died? Their following died with them. Excuse me. And if we look over in Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through through 39, we read the account of the apostles before the Sanhedrin where they wanted to put the apostles to death. At that moment, a Pharisee named Gamaliel stepped up and persuaded them not to when he said, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Think about that today. Those people who are out there speaking against Christ are fighting against God. They're not fighting against us as Christians. <coughs> Excuse me. They're fighting against God. And we as Christians want to stand up and proclaim God and, 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 and know God. We as Christians say that we believe in God, that Jesus is alive, that he is resurrected. Um, those who don't believe have no future. But based on these things and the work of the Holy Spirit in my own life, I truly believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so we ask the question, what does that mean? What Jesus said in John 11, verses 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. The fact is, <clears throat> the, the fact is, outside of the living God, there is no hope. 
hope for eternal life. If we're simply here because of evolution, then when we die, our bodies return to the earth, and that's it. And the reality is that, that most believers in the Old Testament were simply living for God in this life with little hope for eternity. You see, back then it wasn't yet revealed to them, although it was sometimes prophesied about as the prophets look forward to the coming Messiah. But they were living for God in the here and now. So let me ask you a question. Would it be worth it to serve God here and now if it not for eternal life? I think so. I think that serving God and living by His principles and His ideas is still a much better life than living out there on our own. But because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, eternity has been given to all who believe in Him. So again, we ask the second question this morning. What do you believe about the resurrection of Jesus? And again, I remind you that your answer is based on a belief spectrum that ranges from not believing it happened at all at one end, to proclaiming through the word and action of your life to the world at the other end. Now, if we look over in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul said, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. The bottom line is that you can say you believe with your mouth, but what do your actions show to the people around you? If we were to take a poll of your co-workers and your friends and even your family members, what would they say that you believe about the death and the resurrection of Jesus? Have you ever talked about it? Have you shared anything about it? Do you even share if you attend church? The truth is we're all on this journey of life, and what we believe matters. It matters in how we think. It matters in how we act. It matters in how we respond to people. What we believe matters in how our lives interact with those around us. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that where we're at on this belief spectrum is a fluid thing. Generally, we're either moving closer to God or away from God. I kind of feel like it's a, kind of like the people mover at the airport. I don't know if you had a chance to ride those or not, but sometimes when you are at a gate far away from uh, the beginning site, they have these escalators that don't go for now, they go from you know, side to side. Uh, every once in a while we get on them with our luggage and our kids, and uh, one of the kids always seems to want to go backwards a little bit. Well, our faith can be like that too. We're either moving towards God or we're kind of moving away from Him. It's, it's a fluid spectrum. It's a fluid belief based off what we're doing at that moment. Isn't it grateful to know that we're not stuck in one spot forever? But it does take work. It does take a continual seeking out and reading the Word and studying Scripture and, and spending time with others who believe in the same things we believe in and certainly being a part of church. If you're moving closer to God, keep going. If you notice that you're moving away from God, then it's time to stop and turn around. And the truth is that if you're watching and you never really believed in God, decide today before it's too late and start moving towards Him. Decide that you want Him to be in your life, that you want to be reconciled and justified before God because of the work of Jesus Christ, and that you want to have eternal life because of His resurrection. Folks, God loves you. And everything Jesus went through, including his death and resurrection, was for you. Let me say that again. <clears throat> God loves you. And everything that Jesus went through, including his death and resurrection, was for you. If you choose Jesus as your Savior, then his death pays the redeeming price of your sin and reconciles you to God. That's it. <coughs> Nothing else has to be done. The work's already been done. You just have to choose him. And his resurrection proves that he has overcome death, and therefore we can overcome death, and he provides eternal life for us that we can have in heaven. But it comes down to Jesus. It comes down to knowing him, to accepting him, to believing in him, and to living for him. On this Resurrection Sunday, what do you believe? Is Easter Sunday just another day to spend time with family? Is it another day to have an Easter egg hunt? To maybe have a nice dinner? And obviously some of those things we're not going to get to do this year at, at big family groups or as big friends. 
maybe one of the blessings we can take away from this pandemic and this social distancing is the opportunity to simply spend time today with God, to celebrate the resurrection, maybe with just a few family members, whoever's in our household, or, or maybe even if you're all by yourself today. We can spend that time with God, and we can thank Him for the work that He's done, the work because He loves us, because He loves you. And I'm one of those guys who simply believes that even if you were the only one, that Jesus still would have died on the cross and rose again because God loves you that much. As I said, in just a few moments, we're going to partake of communion together. Hopefully you've had the chance to, to grab some, some juice or some other drink, maybe tea or water, whatever it is, and some kind of a bread or cracker, and you're ready to go. If not, as we sing this next song, I want you to go ahead and, and grab that stuff together so that we can partake and celebrate and commemorate what Jesus did for us on the cross. But let's sing this old hymn together, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Again, we pulled this off of YouTube. Thank you to whoever put it together. <laughs>
we partake. Father God, as we come before you this day, as we give thanks to you for this Resurrection Sunday and all that it means for us, it behooves us, Lord, to stop for a minute and examine our own hearts and see where we're at. Father, if we believe as you've ordained communion, that you call all those who have a true repentance forsaken their sins and come unto you to receive together. And so this morning, Lord, we want to have that moment. Father, if there's anyone watching today who has not made things right with you, has not chosen you, has not confessed their sin, may they do so right now, simply by saying, God, take my sin, redeem me that I might be reconciled to you, and choose him today. Father God, as they do so, accept them into you, our, your loving kingdom, and we trust the angels will celebrate. If there's those today watching who are away from you or who have been moving down the wrong way on the people mover of life, Father, we pray right now that they would choose to say, I turn back. I want to get closer to God. And for those, Lord, who are serving you faithfully today, who want more of you, so we, shall we simply choose together, oh God, to want more of you, to choose to get closer to you and ask you, Lord, to bless them. Father, as we partake in just a few moments, this isn't our normal Items that we partake of, but Father, we pray right now that you would take the juice or the tea or the drink we're about to partake of. That you would bless it as a symbolic to the blood of Christ. We pray, O oh God, for the cracker or the bread or whatever we have before us, Lord, that you would bless it as the body of Christ. We pray, Lord, as we partake of it, that you would honor it, not because of what it is, but because of what it means to us as we celebrate all that Jesus did on the cross. Father, thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come around here today. Uh, Stacy's here with me and has already given her the elements before the service, so she's ready to go. And John, <coughs> sorry, in Matthew 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Folks, as we've gathered today, and uh, as we have the communion elements before us, open them up here. I would invite you to take the bread, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broke for you, preserving blameless under everlasting life. Take and eat this, and remember that Christ died for you. Father God, as we come before you, as we partake of this symbol of the broken body of our Lord, Father, we are so grateful today of the price that he paid. So grateful for what he was willing to go through. So grateful, Lord, that as he was being beaten, he was paying the price for us. And Lord, as we partake of this today, we want to use this as a symbol, as a reminder on our own hearts that we now want to give our lives to you. As Jesus has given his life for us, Father, help us to live out our lives in such a way that honors you and pleases you. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for you, present your blameless under everlasting life. Take and drink this and remember that his blood was shed so that you might have eternal life. Again, Father God, as we come before you, as we have partaken now of the symbol of the blood of Jesus, I'm reminded, Lord, that some scholars believe that possibly every last ounce of blood poured out from his body on the day he died, that blood represented life and that he gave his for us. Father, we are humble, and yet we are grateful. And we are thankful for what it means and thankful for the opportunity to celebrate today, even in our hearts. Father, thank you for your great love, and thank you for the celebration we feel in our heart. Thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's try that again in case you forgot. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Folks, God has truly risen. Jesus has risen. Uh, he has gone on to be with the Father. He is right now at the Father's side on our behalf. And, of course, God has given us the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us each step of our path in our lives. I hope you know today that 
that you are loved. I hope you know today that if you don't have a place where you can worship, that you're always welcome to worship with us. Um, whether or not, or however long the social distancing thing lasts, we, we pray that God's will will be for us to continue with these online services. Uh, we would love and want to be a part of your life. And so please feel free to uh, speak back on our Facebook page or wherever it is to communicate with us. We would love to be able to pray for you uh, any ways that we can. We'd love to be able to, to talk with you and reach out to you. And let's all be praying together that God will open the door for us to meet just as soon as we can. Let's pray in a final closing prayer this morning. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord, for these two questions about what do we really believe in our heart about the death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We pray, Lord, that you would take it and examine our lives today. That you would show us where we're doing well and, and help us and transform us in those areas where maybe we're struggling. Father, we pray today as we are dealing with a new Easter, meaning we've never done Easter this way before, at least for most of us, Father, that you would use this time to draw ourselves close to you. That our focus would be more on you today than, than it has been in Easter for a long time. Father, today we want to pray for people. We pray for those, Lord, who are suffering today. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving today for the loss of a loved one. Maybe this is our first Easter without a loved one, especially if it happened because of this virus. But there's many who are facing Easter without a loved one in their lives. Father, would you bless them today and would you meet their need? Would your grace and mercy rest upon them? Father, we pray for those who are struggling with the virus right now, for those who are alone in hospital rooms and who are trying to be in contact with family over phones and over iPads and all these other things. Father, would you just fill their room with your presence? May they just sense your peace and your help around them. Father, we pray for the first responders that are taking care of them, for the doctors and for the nurses, uh, for the EMTs and firefighters and all those who are doing their best to help them recover. Father, would you bestow upon them godly wisdom to help people and to help heal people? And Father, we pray those things according to your will. We also want to thank you today and pray, Lord, for those who are essential workers who service us in every area, from grocery store workers to uh, wherever the place might be, Father, would you protect them and watch over them today as well. And Father, we pray for our country and for our world because this is a worldwide issue. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to get past this height of this pandemic and start to return back more to a normal life. But Father, we also pray at the same time that through this, that people would come to know you. That people who are right now lost would reach out and accept your love. That you would use us as your children to share our faith with others in however way as possible we can. We pray, Lord, you would use this time to draw those back to you who maybe have slipped away to the point where they're no longer praying or reading their scripture or meeting with others. Father, use this time to glorify yourself, to bring about a healing to your creation. Father, help us to, help us to simply be obedient in our region now. Father, today we pray that you would be with those who are hurting, be with those who are hurting physically, whether it be the virus or something else going on in their life. We pray that you would be with those who are hurting financially as record numbers of people are filing for unemployment and wondering about how to make things, how to make ends meet. But Father, we know that you are the God who provides for all things, that you own all things. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would provide as you see fit to bring yourself forward. Father, we pray, pray that you provide for those who are struggling emotionally, those who may be wondering why they're here or what their purpose is. Father, would you provide right now your presence in such a way that it reminds them that they're your creation and important to you. Father, it seems like every day or every week we hear of people who commit suicide. Father, we want that to end. We want people to know your presence. And Father, today we pray for those who are simply struggling in their faith. You know, our, you know each heart and each mind. Would you make yourself known a new and a fresh of people? And for that, we give you great praise. Father, now just go with us throughout this day. Again, help us to focus on you more so than ever before. And we go with us throughout this week. May we have opportunity to bask in your sunshine or in your warmth. May we be able to look around us and see your, the beauty of nature that you provided to us wherever we're at. And Lord, may you help us to connect, one, connect with one another. Father, thank you for all that you're about to do. In the name of
the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for these things. Amen. God bless you. May you be blessed this week. May you may God's blessings rain down upon you.